Who's gonna teach us to read? Who's gonna keep water clean? Who's gonna make the future clean? Who's gonna keep energy green? people i know a thing or two about extinction going extinct is a bad thing and driving yourselves extinct in 70 million years that's the most ridiculous thing i've ever heard don't choose extinction save your species before it's too late it's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes thank you
teach us to read? Who's gonna keep water clean? Who's gonna make the future clean? Who's gonna keep energy green? Now you have to unmute. Charlie, you need to unmute. We cannot hear you. I'm telling you, unmute you. What are you? Uh, Natalia, man, can you hear us? Uh, Nisalia, thank you very much. Your uh, audio was on mute, so I'm not sure colleagues um, uh, were able to get what you said, but um, uh, if you want to briefly repeat what you said, that would be good because people, I mean, participants would get the figure. Uh, okay, very, very sorry about this. I thought uh, colleagues will unmute me. But what I wanted to say is that we are trying to decode this massive gathering of 25,000 people that uh, gathered in Glasgow to talk about what we have to do to save the planet. But the main thread that comes through our conversation is what is media doing? Are we doing enough? Uh, so this is the brief for the next uh, two hours, and I welcome Javad Muntagi to give his welcoming remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, we are members, uh, friends and partners. Welcome to the summit. And thank you for joining this event, which is so important for the media. Our focus will be on COP26, as Natalia said, which draws new agenda of the fight to stop the overheating of the planet and rising temperature, reaching a tipping point of no return, which will bring devastating drought, hurricanes, rising sea levels. We in the media know how high the stakes are. Our newsroom daily report on increasing natural hazards. We know that the decisions we all take today as politicians, business leaders, citizens, consumers, media professionals will determine the future of our children and grandchildren. In Glasgow, we saw how angry young people are. They want change and they want it now. They want commitment, not promises, actions, not words. We will leave the assessment of the success of Glasgow COP26 to others. This is not our business. Our work, our duty and mandate as media professionals are to take action and to fulfill our responsibility as media, to inform and educate people. I will get even further. We media professionals have to actively advocate for advancing the green agenda of new global green deal 
the summit is evidence that we take this responsibility very seriously indeed. We will prioritize our efforts to inform and educate our audience about the complex issues of climate crisis and the way forward. We will do also have more efforts to change people's behavior. With that, I wish everyone a fruitful and productive summit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javad. It is uh, my pleasure now to introduce Mami Mitsutori, Special Representative of United Nations Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction, who is delivering her keynote speech remotely. Excellencies, distinguished delegates and colleagues, we meet only weeks after the COP26, which underscored the need to act urgently on climate change. The Earth is already 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than it was 150 years ago, with impacts felt in each and every region. This leaves us at a critical crossroads. The climate emergency is undermining the ability to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as well as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. At COP26, UNDRR made a call to action in three critical areas. First, dramatically scale up adaptation. Second, significantly increase support for averting, minimizing, and addressing losses and damages. And third, accelerating predictable investment and financing. I'm happy that these messages resonated strongly in Glasgow. The pledge from global leaders to shift towards locally led adaptation was also promising. We know that local communities are already feeling the impact of climate change. And in Geneva, UNDRR is also accelerating its contribution to climate action. At the global level and in partnership with the World Meteorological Organization, we have established the Center of Excellence for Climate and Disaster Resilience. This platform will allow agencies to collaborate to reduce climate and disaster related risks through sharing of data, research and tools. At the national level, we are supporting member state governments to improve their data quality and analysis for better climate and risk informed planning. And at the local level, we are promoting comprehensive disaster and climate risk management through our Making Cities Resilient 2030 initiative for building local resilience. These are all important steps forward, but we can and must do more. Advocacy and information sharing are critical for effectively addressing the climate emergency. We have seen the dangers posed by infodemics in the COVID-19 crisis. Misinformation has contributed to the unnecessary loss of lives, and this could happen in any disaster scenario. The need for communities to have access to credible, trusted information is more critical than ever. That is why UNDRR see media as a key partner for shaping the global transformation to achieve resilience. You, the media, have an invaluable role to play not just in reporting about climate change and disasters, but in understanding the why on what is happening and the how for providing solutions. Through UNDRR's innovative training partnership with the Asia Broadcasting Union, we are building robust disaster risk reduction knowledge and reporting capacity throughout the region and the world. We look forward to expanding this initiative with you through 2022 and beyond. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction clearly states that we need an all-of-society approach if we are to build disaster and climate resilient communities, and the media is a key piece in this important puzzle. Thank you very much. We thank Mami for her inspiring words and for her trust in media as a partner in climate action and disaster risk reduction. Before we start the main sessions, I would just uh, like to apologize. We don't have time for questions from the audience, but please keep sending your questions in the chat box. We will come back by email from relevant speakers. And now let's start. <music>
The mission of the COP26 was to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degree in comparison with pre-industrial level. This first session will summarize the main results of COP26. Um, let me introduce the moderator, Russell Isaac, who has been associated with uh, capacity building with ABU for many years. Russell, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia, and hello, everybody. Welcome to this first session uh, of this conference. And uh, as we're looking at COP, of course, it was the, the biggest climate gathering of the year. Um, it was built up to be the event that would move us on in the struggle to face climate challenges. But sometimes we have to look back in time to look forward. You okay? You need a minute? Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. And let me tell you, and you'd kind of think this would be obvious, going extinct is a bad thing. And driving yourselves extinct? In 70 million years, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. At least we had an asteroid. What's your excuse? You're headed for a climate disaster, and yet every year governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Think of all the other things you could do with that money. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? Let me be real for a second. You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic, this is humanity's big chance. So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you. That was an interesting little video, I think, that you'd, uh, that, 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 that's good to see at the, the top of any conference. But I suppose the dinosaur uh, in the video, um, it was a metaphor to, 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 to many of the old and perhaps, uh, and perhaps out of touch people uh, who, who attended. Um, this was my third COP. Uh, and perhaps I'm no longer representative of a younger generation who want action. Uh, not just words, but 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 uh, the, the person that I'm talking to today is certainly no dinosaur. Even though Glasgow uh, was his twelfth COP, uh, Dr. Yuri Rogeli, he is director of research at the Grantham Institute, and and reader in climate science and policy at Imperial College London. Dr. Rogeli, thank you so much for joining us, and 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 let me ask you first of all, um, yeah, I, I mean you're a veteran now of so many COPs. What did you take away from Glasgow this year? Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. Um, I think to, to look at the takeaways, uh, I also want to look back, not the millions of years as the, from, from the dinosaurs, but, f but uh, five or six years ago to the, the, the Paris uh, summit, uh, where actually this international framework for climate action 
was established. And um, <clears throat> COP26 was the fifth COP after uh, the Paris summit. And um, this was the first time that countries needed to come back with updated pledges and with long-term strategies. So it was a key COP. Um, and what, what did it deliver? I think there is reason for hope and there is reason for concern. Um, in terms of um, pledges and of, of countries, we have seen lots of progress on long-term pledges on so-called net zero targets where countries um, set themselves a target to make sure that they don't add any carbon dioxide anymore or other greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Um, we've also seen progress on the NDCs, the shorter term targets, which are called the national determined contributions. But in many cases, uh, the challenge is that these near term targets are not yet in line with the long term targets. Uh, overall, there, there is, there is reasons for hope because from just 10 years ago, the temperature projections were pointing towards three degrees and more warming if we were implementing all the targets that were on the table. Now those projections point towards below two degrees temperatures, not yet the well below two degrees or 1.5 that are inscribed in the Paris Agreement, but significantly better. So that is one important takeaway. Um, other aspects that have been decided in Paris are, for example, the Paris rulebook, which are the nuts and bolts of how the Paris Agreement will effectively be implemented um, in terms of uh, transparency, reporting, and so on. These and, and also carbon trading. Uh, these rules are technical, but they are really important because it really means uh, that we have entered a new stage from negotiating the rules to implementing them and, and to implementing action. And that one of my key takeaways is also from, from the copies and also to see a real shift in the societal discourse compared to five years ago. I think until five years ago, it was really the United Nations negotiations that were pulling the societal discourse. They were setting targets about first about two degrees, then well below two degrees, 1.5. In the last five years, um, it's, more, it's more society that is really pushing the UN for being even more ambitious. Really, 1.5 has been established as kind of a de facto target um, of, of many civil society movements and also for, of many governments. Um, so that is really interesting uh, development. Finally, and, and I think all those developments are very positive. There is one dimension where I see many challenges uh, and all the aspects I spoke about now are about mitigation, about how we uh, avoid climate change. Now, uh, there are still important challenges with uh, adaptation and uh, uh, an aspect of loss and damages. So the, the damages that occur even despite our best efforts to adapt. You mentioned there your, your, your reasons for hope. Uh, well, of course, one of the elements that you focus on uh, in your particular studies at Imperial College is, is how societies can transform into more sustainable futures. So, so did this year's COP help at all in this process? I definitely think so. I mean, overall, there is a... Um, there is a stronger involvement of, um, of also the, the private sector and of civil society in those COPs. And that is important because, of course, uh, targets can be set by governments, but ultimately the implementation, um, even if it's regulated or directed by policies, will be done uh, either by the private sector in, in, in civil society and so on. So seeing that involvement of those groups uh, in the climate negotiations um, in, in, in a more intense way uh, is uh, definitely a reason for hope. There are also examples where um, the last COP, besides the official pledges, uh, where countries came forward uh, with, with, with official targets, there were also what was referred to as sectorial targets. There was a global methane pledge, where countries pledged to, uh, to reduce their methane emissions, one on uh, the electrification of of transport, another one on uh, phasing out coal or phasing out deforestation. And all these pledges, while they might not add that much additional to what countries 
already are, are promising, they really help to gather momentum to make sure that lessons learned can be shared. Uh, and thus they increase our confidence that these pledges and these emission reductions will actually be achieved um, in all the different countries and all the different contexts that we see, um, well, that we have around the globe. Th 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 thanks for explaining that. Um, let's, let's turn a little bit more now to the role of the media. And at these high profile events, the, the media do tend to concentrate, of course, on the political statements and arguments. But I must admit, even as a media practitioner myself, for, for me, COP is much more than this. It's an opportunity for, for, for great minds and intellects to get together and work on solutions. Isn't this one of the roles that the media should also be taking? The, the media should first and foremost uh, inform, and, and if the information uh, covers all these aspects. Uh, it, it, uh, it, the, the role of the media is indeed to, to cover both the political discussions, but then uh, there is also that much more uh, about it. There is uh, important, I think, in the last couple of years, we have seen a very strong shift towards uh, the identification and implementation of solutions and, um, and also a lot of uh, goodwill and momentum uh, with different actors. And I think it is really useful for the media, uh, particularly national media, to bring it down from, from, the, from the theoretical. Uh, if, I, if, if countries say we will be reducing our emissions by 60%, uh, by 2030 uh, to the practical, to bring it down to what that means for, for communities, for, for the context of a particular country. How do you make um, populations, local populations understand what that means, but also how do you make those populations understand the choices they have? And that is really, those choices are important because we don't try to achieve climate change um, protection, uh, be it through reducing emissions or adapting to climate change, in an isolated um, in an isolated bubble. We are trying to achieve this together with all the other sustainable development goals that um, th that are uh, also set. And these include uh, eradication of poverty, food security, water security, um, biodiversity protection, and um, and there, important choices have to be made and, 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 and people have to be informed. And I think the media can play an important role to show these, um, these visions, to show these options, but also to highlight that ultimately what we are striving for here is a desirable future. We are not trying to achieve a future where we have to cut out lots of things and, and end up in a very barren uh, life. No, we are trying to achieve a desirable future where we deal with climate change and we achieve so many other goals that we as a society care about. Let, let, let me briefly push you on this just to, just to finalize our discussion. Should the media actually be managing expectations rather than feeding the, the, the frenzy, if you like, and the hype that many politicians create? In terms of the, the, the large climate summits, absolutely. Uh, the most of these climate summits have a really clear mandate of what uh, they are aiming to achieve, what is on the agenda, and uh, so also there, there are key, key, key limits to what will ever come out of one particular um, summit. And for example, with this last uh, COP, so this last climate summit in Glasgow, I've read stories in the media about, um, about the expectations that this would again, uh, provide legally binding targets, um, that, this will, um, uh, that, that, that this will set targets that are simply not on the agenda. And I think there, uh, there is a clear uh, role for the media to, to make sure that it's clearly communicated, that people also afterwards appreciate the progress has been, that has been made uh, instead of uh, being disappointed that their unrealistic expectations have not come true. Dr. Rajali, thank you very much indeed for those insightful thoughts. And of course, the very best of luck to you with your future research. OK, so that brings uh, this first session to an end. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rajali. I enjoyed it. I hope the rest of you did also. Natalia. 
Um, yes, thank you for this very brief and very concise information about uh, the goals and results of COP26. Uh, thank you very much. The last report of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, this is the UN body assessing climate change, issued code red for humanity. This session gives the scientists point of view and their stark warning, no time for delays. Our future climate depends on our decisions now. Um, to bring the conversation alive with us is um, uh, Mr. Ratik Kainan Ahmed, technical lead, on Climate Risk Management in Asian Disaster Preparedness Center. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for inviting us for this particular session. This is a very important session because as you have heard from the previous session that you know, the COP is really uh, asking for the climate action immediately. But basically, all these actions needs to be based on the climate science and penetrating through the communications to the community and different type of stakeholders. This particular session would talk about this climate science, what science says, and also what can be communicated and how this can be communicated to the people. So that part is really important for this particular session as well, but really understanding and based on the science, what science says. We are very delighted to have uh, with us in this particular session two distinguished uh, panelists. First, uh, Mr. Dr. Benjamin Strauss, who is uh, offline connected. He has provided a video message due to the different time zone from Climate Central. He's the president and CEO of Climate Central. And we are very delighted to have uh, with us Dr. Ben Churchill, the head of the regional office for Asia and the Southwestern Pacific uh, from WMO. Uh, we'll start with the video of uh, Mr. Dr. Ben Strauss to primarily focusing on the sea level rise issues. Uh, if I might request the Secretariat to run that particular video first. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks so much to the ABU for having me. My name is Dr. Benjamin Strauss. I'm CEO and Chief Scientist of Climate Central. Uh, based in New Jersey in the United States. Today, I'm going to talk about picturing our future, a free tool to help tell stories and illustrate the sea level stakes connected to different amounts of climate change in coastal locations all around the world. And specifically, how different levels of warming we could, uh, that, that could occur this century, depending on our choices, even this decade, can lead and lock in and lead to centuries of sea level rise. And also a look at what the risks are this century. But I'm gonna start with this long-term sea level rise that we can lock in through our choices today. And we're gonna start with an image based on scientific projections of that sea level locked in by three degrees Celsius warming for Dubai. Here's a look at the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, submerged at its base and almost all of downtown Dubai. That's what happens after we let the planet warm by three degrees Celsius. But what if we limit warming to one and a half degrees? Here's the projection then. And so I'm going to take you on a quick world tour of different scenes, three degrees versus one and a half. Next, the Jeddah Tower, Saudi Arabia, being built to be even taller than Burj Khalifa after three degrees or one and a half skyscrapers in Shanghai. The thousand year old temple of literature in Hanoi 
Vietnam. Lalbag Fort in Dhaka, Bangladesh. In this scene in Mumbai, the camera itself would be underwater after three versus one and a half. The small island nation of the Maldives, cameras underwater. And jumping to the island of Cuba. And now all the way south to Cape Town, Africa, all of downtown almost, it seems, well, a core of downtown, but not after one and a half. Now, all of these images also have corresponding maps. The map, we have hundreds, well, a thousand images for hundreds of locations, but maps covering every piece of the global coast. Here's a look at Cape Town. The yellow shows you that almost everything could be saved by limiting warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. The purple shows areas that would be below high tide after one and a half degrees Celsius warming. Now remember, this is a multi-century perspective. Here's a look at Shanghai, very different story. You can see even with one and a half degrees Celsius warming, a massive area would be affected. Of course, defenses can be built. Some have been built. Many more, I expect, will be built. But how deep a bowl do you want to live at the bottom of? There is very great jeopardy on this river delta uh, in East Asia. Now, we also have maps that look to the near term. Here's a look at Mumbai, projected high tide line by mid-century in a mid-range scenario, or projected annual flood level. There's a real range of possibilities. And you can choose year, scenario, any place in the world. Finally, I'll conclude by sharing a little video that um, goes back to the long-term perspective and I hope will be really eye-opening. Again, free to use with attribution, and I hope it will support your storytelling and illustrations for your audiences. Thank you for sharing this particular video. This video shows how really science can be communicated in a different way to keep these concerns. 
would like to now move into a conversation with uh, Dr. Ben Churchill, who is the head of WMO Asia Pacific and uh, Southern Western Pacific. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ben Churchill. Uh, I'd like to ask you, with your vast experience, you have a lot of experiences, but within this short time, a few questions. First, what is the role of media in communicating science to people? Because we have seen various other roles, uh, you know, media play, but particularly to communicate science, what are the role uh, media can play? Over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Atik, and thank you to ABU to uh, having me here today. Um, it, it's a very good question, and I think the media plays a critically important role in helping enable the public and also the policymakers to learn about, listen to, understand, and appreciate science. Um, as uh, Yavad Motagi captured it so well in his introductory remarks, it's about informing and educating. So it's really important to focus on facts and not chase headlines. Um, you only have to have a look at how the mainstream media has handled what is arguably one of humanity's most significant challenges in the world's history, a global pandemic combined with a climate crisis. And history tells us that the pandemic is most likely time bound and may only persist for years or at worst uh, decades, whereas climate change is, is here to stay. Um, there's been a lot of excellent reporting um, and sharing of important information, and I want to give the media credit for that. Um, but there's also um, a lot of misinformation um, in, in the community, and um, that's resulted in poor outcomes. So uh, with the vast amount of uh, data information available uh, to, to all of us um, on a regular basis through multiple platforms, I think there's a, a responsibility to uh, ensure that we're telling the right stories in the right way. So um, look, just in summary, I think a helpful media article on climate will come from a trusted source and mm -hmm. tell an interesting factual story. And I like the reference uh, Dr. Strauss made to, to storytelling. I think that's really important here. Um, taking a balanced and thorough approach um, and understanding and engaging with the audience, um, explaining the concepts and encouraging people to make smart decisions and choices based on robust science. Thanks, I take. Thank you uh, for a wonderful answer, actually. I mean, uh, taking information from trusted sources and also relying this storytelling is very important. But at the same time, what we uh, see that science often communicate with some uncertainties and the uncertainties are, you know, issues that needs to be trans uh, translated and communicated to the community. Uh, how do you think media can play and what role media should play in this perspective? Yeah, another excellent question. And, and we all know that uncertainties exist in, in everyday life and, and we must and we do accept a level of uncertainty and risk. Um, how we navigate through the world is, is often based on our own lived experience. Uh, we, we drive cars, fly in planes, take medicine, buy products, eat food, etc. Um, based on our knowledge and experience and, and often on the advice of trusted authorities. Um, probability is in itself a complex mm -hmm. concept for, for many. Um, explaining the chance of a toy cost is one thing, but when it comes to probability and uncertainty associated with weather, climate, water, and the environment in an earth system context, it can be confusing. So I think the media has a role in, in unpacking all of that and breaking it down into simple terms that can be easily understood. So in the science communication and also science-based actions, how do you think we can really enable policymakers to really use more and more the science-based information? And in your place, basically with WMO, uh, you're sharing a, quite a lot of trusted information, authenticated information as well. So if you could kindly explore a little bit on that, yep. thank you. Yeah, just, just briefly, because I'm conscious of the time, but uh, finding solutions to tackle climate change and mitigate loss and damage, um, particularly in the Asia Pacific region where I'm uh, focusing my attention, um, it's a complex task and it requires a coordinated and collaborative approach uh, where international regional organisations, national governments, donors, local communities all come together to collaborate on these solutions and delivering concrete actions that make a real difference to those who need it the most. Thank you, Dr. Ben, and your wonderful interactions and all these things. This is just a tipping point of the vast information that is available through WMO, through Climate Central and very various others. So we would really encourage you to look at those set of information along with the IPCC, uh, you know, the first physical science-based working group. One report came next year would be two more installments coming. With this, yep. we'd like to conclude this particular session with a big thanks to the panelists as well as the organizers. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nathalia. Thank you, Atik. Thank you. Thank you.
what an apocalyptic future we are facing if we don't act now and media should really uh, strive to get the message across loud and clear. Thank you for the panel for this sobering <laughs> uh, eye opener. We had a glimpse of what the future might hold for big cities on coast, but now we come to a country that already experiences this future. Uh, we are honored to have with us the live from Madagascar, the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development, in discussion with uh, Ms. Bridget Leoni, Global Coordinator of the World Broadcasting Union's UNDRR Media Saving Lives Initiative. Thank you, Natalia. I'm very pleased to focus this session on Madagascar, which is, which is affected by the worst famine ever. And to have with us today as main guest, the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Madagascar, <laughs> Madame Baho Miyavotse Vainala Raha Rini Rina. But before we start our conversation, uh, we would like to show you now one TV report that was broadcast recently on uh, Dutch Welle on the current hunger situation in South Madagascar. Now, Madagascar is paying one of the highest prices for climate change, which they have done little to cause. The toughest droughts in 40 years have left thousands on the island on the brink of starvation. Malnourished children and adults are forced to forage for leaves to eat. But aid groups say that the help reaching the island is doing little to stop the situation getting worse. This was once fertile farmland, but now it's a desert. Years of drought have destroyed nearly all of the crops here. Strong winds sweeping away the soil and then sandstorms covering what's left. Entire communities are on the brink of starvation. People here have resorted to eating whatever they can find. In the morning, I prepare this plate of insects. I clean them the best I can without any water. For eight months, my children and I have been eating this plant every day. We have nothing else to eat and no rain to grow crops. People here are on the front line of a global climate crisis. Madagascar hardly emits any greenhouse gases, but it's one of the worst victims of climate change. We're facing the worst drought in over 40 years. And this is an area where people depend on their own agriculture, homegrown school meals, smallholder farmers. This is how they live down here. But with drought back to back to back, people can't survive. The cycle of drought is tearing families apart. These two boys orphaned after their mother died of hunger. They've been taken in by another family, but severely malnourished, they're still not getting enough to eat. We have nothing left. Their mother is dead, and my husband is dead. What do you want me to say? Our life centers around looking for cactus leaves to survive. Nearly a million people in southern Madagascar depend on food aid. Some people here walked for hours to get help but not everyone is healthy enough to make the long journey. Aid organizations are urging that more be done to help Madagascar. Food to feed the hungry mouths and finally action on climate change. Madam Minister, many thanks to be with us today. Um, you were in Glasgow last month attending COP26. Did the conference meet your expectations? Thank you, and thank you for inviting us. First of all, uh, we can say that uh, we were very pleased to see that all parties were committed to the fight against climate change, and in particular to achieving the 1.5 goal. And all country parties to the UNFCC are aware also of the imminent dangers caused by the uh, effects of climate change and are pre pressing for climate action. But 
let's say that there is also a tendency to separate loss and damage and adaptation, which will be the detrimental to the whole process. However, as a least developed country and part of the African group, uh, let, let's say that we are uh, disappointed, disappointed that the funding for loss and damage were not considered in the Glasgow uh, Climate Pact. Uh, and, and as we, we saw in this video, the South region of Madagascar is an example of loss and damage. And it was said in this video that Madagascar uh, has not emitted uh, green gas emission, green gas house. Uh, uh, emission. Africa uh, is re responsible for only 3% of uh, GHG uh, emissions. So we were, uh, let's say, disappointed. With okay. the... and, and so, so you're saying it, but I mean, how did you, uh, how do you judge the international and, and the regional response to it so far? Because I think there were many reports already, but I mean, the how do you judge the response to this famine, and especially the international one? Yeah, uh, let's say that in order to find an equitable solution to climate change and to this uh, uh, deep south crisis of Madagascar, it is really imperative for us that our countries party to the UNFCC and having ratified the Paris Agreement, respect the principle laid down by the convention, namely the principle of common differentiated responsibility and this principle of equity must therefore be respected at all costs developed and industrial countries which are the biggest emitters must take their responsibility by effectively implementing their commitments to reduce their emission but also to help countries vulnerable to climate change to adapt we need to found this adaptation action plan. And we have now to go forward to a resilient approach, not only humanitarian approach. And this is our biggest pledge now to say to the uh, uh, partners and the countries who were helping Madagascar for this South crisis, that we need now to move to the resilient approach, not only aid uh, uh, in short part of the year. Okay, at the COP you were quite vocal and you called for climate empathy, which is quite a new notion, I would say. Can you explain what you meant? Yes, so in general, the northern uh, and developed countries are the largest emitters of uh, greenhouse gases and historically responsible for climate change, but they don't respect their commitments too much, never in terms of uh, uh, emission reduction, nor in terms of budget allocation in the funds intended to help developing countries stop with the effects of climate change. And we also see that Madagascar is one of the, uh, let's say, uh, zero uh, emis emission now, or 0 0.001 now. So we need to integrate this uh, um, approach uh, regarding the, the philosoph philosoph philosophical um, vision to see that we cannot leave Madagascar like this, these people who are not responsible for this situation. So empathy, climate empathy is to, to say, what, uh, what, will, what will you do if you were in this case of Madagascar? And the other thing to, to point out is that Madagascar is facing three uh, you could huge issues. First, the uh, poverty elevation, loss of biodiversity, and climate change issues. So these are uh, very uh, big issues to, to deal with. And for a, a country like Madagascar, there is no possibility to have, a, um, to have a, let's say, uh, uh, to, 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 to make these people have faith in the future if there is no uh, solidarity, climate solidarity. So when I say climate empathy, it is to, to go beyond the climate negotiations. It, it's also how can we uh, bring dignity to these people? How can you bring faith and hope? 
So I know you said that you were a bit disappointed, you know, for the COP, I mean, uh, for what happened at the COP26, but among all what has been said and recommended in Glasgow, what main recommendation have you taken back home? Yeah, as mentioned, as mentioned by the president of the Republic of Madagascar, we advocate for the energy transition in Africa and the preservation of forests. Madagascar has got 5% of the biodiversity, of the global biodiversity. So it is carbon sink, it is uh, um, world heritage. It, 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 Madagascar has many things to conserve for the world and also as a, as a country which contributes to this climate solidarity. And uh, our president, His Excellency Andrea Duel, recalled also the urgency of the situation and the urge international leaders to act quickly. So now we must act today and not tomorrow or wait until 2030 or the next COP. And uh, he said failure is not an option. So now for Madagascar, the, the, the recommendations is to, uh, to make all the stakeholders here working together on adaptation and mitigation and also fight uh, um, deforestation. Okay, so now, now coming back on the role of the media, how do you see the role of media in alerting and informing the world about the partic this particular event, and especially what is happening in your in your country? There were many reports, but I mean, was it enough? I mean, how do you judge that? How do you judge the media participation in alerting and yeah. informing about this famine? Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, uh, a very pertinent question. So for me, climate change is everyone's business and not just the government uh, assignment. So we, we, we really need that everyone, everyone has a minimum of responsibility in the fight against the uh, harmful effects of uh, climate change. Uh, for us, we need first a, a um, participatory process in every initiative with various actors from civil society, from the public and private sector, universities, NGOs, academics. And we, we believe that communicators and journalists are uh, play a key role in this process. And uh, in addition, we recognize that if climate change message do not uh, also target communicators, they will not spread widely enough. So there is a lot of let's say there is a lot of technical terminology of academic information that needs to be explained and because we especially uh, need to learn as communicators how to talk about climate change how do you spread it with a country like madagascar where 80 percent of population are illiterated how do you talk about climate change with rural communities, with uh, urban communities. We now, we, we are talking a lot about this uh, uh, famine in Madagascar, but we also have uh, a flood, flood issues and the problem in the east coast of, uh, uh, um, of the sea level rise. So we are facing many, many issues of climate change and we really need to inform and to integrate people uh, especially local communities in the solutions as well. Okay, so thank you very much for, for, for this um, interview. And I would like to thank you for your time as well, because I know it's a bit early in Madagascar, but it's been a very a great honor to have you with us and to hear your opinion and to uh, actually recall the importance of media to alert, inform and raise awareness, you know, on the negative impacts of climate change and in particular in your country. So I will now give the floor to Natalia. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you much for, for leading this session. So uh, important session and uh, we are grateful to the minister for her time and her passionate presentation of her country's case, not only in COP, but here in our summit. Uh, so we move to the next session now. It had all the trappings of a formal cabinet meeting, 
except that the government ministers were 20 feet underwater and wearing scuba gear. The president of the Maldive Islands and 13 other officials took their seats at a table on the seafloor below the surface of a lagoon. Discussions were limited to hand signals and white boards. As bubbles floated up from their face masks, the cabinet signed a document calling on all countries to cut their carbon dioxide emissions. The ministers predict that if the pace of greenhouse gas emission and rising sea levels is not curbed, most of their country would disappear beneath the waves of the Indian Ocean within a century. This is a challenging situation. And we want to see that everyone else is also um, occupied as much as we are and would like to see that people actually do something about it. If Maldives cannot be saved today, we do not feel that there is much of a chance for the rest of the world. The islands average seven feet above sea level. The president is a certified diver, but the other ministers had to take diving lessons in recent weeks. These uh, images of this meeting in 2009 went viral around the world, but it seems not much has changed in the last 12 years. In Tuvalu, we are living the realities of climate change, sea level rise, as you stand watching me today at COP26. We cannot wait for speeches when the sea is rising around us all the time. Climate mobility must come to the forefront. We must take bold, alternative action today to secure tomorrow. Faftailasi, Tuvalu Modeatu. The point that Tuvalu's foreign minister Kofi wanted to make uh, was that the place from which he addressed COP26 delegates was actually dry land very few years back. In Glasgow, the low-lying islands representatives were vocal and visible and really loud, not vocal, really loud. But is it possible for small island developing states to have outside influence in any negotiations regarding climate change. We put this uh, question to the Fiji's Attorney General and Minister responsible for climate change, Mr. Ayas Sayat Khayun. Uh, we believe so. In fact, we think that we actually have been doing so uh, for the past number of years. Uh, because of the fact that we are the cold face of climate change, it does give us that that voice. Uh, for many of the Pacific Island countries, it's an existential threat. Countries like, for example, Tuvalu and Kiribati, they're only 12 feet above sea level, so rising sea waters obviously has a huge impact on them. Uh, and uh, the other fact is that we have the moral authority in the sense that uh, we, our carbon footprint is almost negligible. In Fiji's case, for example, it's 0.006 percent. Notwithstanding that, we have actually made a commitment to go to net zero emissions by 2050 a 30% reduction by 2030. So, you know, uh, the, the point being that even though you may, have all, you may have almost negligible carbon footprint, we are still looking at reducing our carbon footprint. So it, it does, in a way, give you that moral authority to speak to the high emitters and say, look, guys, you know, even though we have very low emitters, we are still making an effort, so can you. Um, and, and I think the fact that we have been uh, in the international fora wherever the opportunity has arisen. We've actually created those opportunities also uh, to make sure that our voices are heard. I think it is also critically important to understand that it's not only about creating awareness, but it also is about getting some practical runs on the board. So, for example, we've been talking to the World Bank for a number of years and saying, look, even though you may deem us to be a middle-income country, we can have, in fact, our economy devastated within a matter of hours. So we had a cyclone, Winston, cyclone Winston in 2016, which within 36 hours wiped off one third of the value of our GDP. Uh, and so that makes us a lot more vulnerable. So therefore we need to have access to concessional financing, which we do now from the World Bank. And only a few days ago, we started to, or we have now qualified to get concessional financing from the Asian Development Bank. 
So these types of awareness raising, noise making is critically important, but also to highlight the fact that if we actually don't get assisted, uh, then we are in a constant sort of cycle of spiraling out of control in respect of our development agendas. And indeed, how can we meet our SDG goals if we are going to be constantly on a year base, yearly basis affected by these climatic events that sets our development, basic development agenda further back? So the opportunity to be able to reach SDGs is limited, both by these events and the fact that you need finance to be able to meet the SDG goals. We also asked the Honourable Minister um, Sayyad Hayum, even if the wealthy countries meet their obligations to provide big amounts of money to mitigate the damage experienced by island states, would that be enough to save the low-lying islands? Is there still time to turn back the clock? Look, the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius uh, target is what we say needs to be achieved. Because if you go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius pre industrial level, uh, it will prove to be quite catastrophic. Even countries like Bangladesh, with the current sort of trajectory, will lose 17% of their land mass. Um, so we, we have to understand that all low lying countries, for example, if you're talking about sea level rise, will get affected. Um, for us, what is really important, of course, is adaptation also. It's not about only mitigation. Yes, mitigation is critically important. We need to reduce the overall carbon footprint. But there are many countries in the world that need to adapt to climate change now. So in Fiji's case, for example, we need to build seawalls. We've uh, relocated villages and living places to, you know, uh, six of them to higher ground or different locations. Now we've got another 40 that needs to be relocated. That's apart from the ones that need to be protected by seawalls. So, you know, whether it's nature-based solutions in, in terms of the seawall or your basic, you know, standardized seawall construction. So adaptation is one, one area that we need to be able to focus on. So this is why we argue about adaptation. The adaptation financing and the Paris Agreement process has been now increased. Uh, we are saying also the $100 billion target needs to be met. They've actually not met that. There's now a process that, that by 2023 it should be met. Uh, the UK had put in place uh, Germany and Canada as the as a committee to ensure that those who are falling behind actually are able to, you know, uh, contribute the hundred billion dollars. So we need money for adaptation. Also, it's not just about mitigation. If you look at most of the vulnerable countries and in particular island countries, we'll all talk about adaptation. They'll also talk about loss and damage because. The, the, the way it works is this, if you don't mitigate at the right time, then the effects of lack of mitigation, you need to adapt, adapt more. If you don't have enough financing and resources available for adaptation, then there will be significant loss and damage. And loss and damage basically means you've lost something completely, you cannot go back to it, so how do you actually compensate for that? So from, from the uh, island uh, nation state perspective, we need to ensure that there's a lot more funding available for adaptation. But most certainly we need to ensure that the carbon, overall carbon footprint needs to be arrested. Uh, it needs, we need to control it, bring it within the 1.5 degrees Celsius. The minister also talked about the role of media in accelerating climate action. Um, I think there's a lot more can be done. Uh, to be frank, and I can only I can't talk about all the other Pacific Island countries, but I can talk about Fiji. I think the Fijian media uh, needs to develop a lot more sophistication in the way that they discuss climate change. Uh, they seem to have their high and lows. So whenever there's a COP, then they all talk about the COP. Uh, then they kind of sort of disappear from that space. I think there needs to be a uh, there is a need for uh, journalists to become specialists, for example, in climate change. There are many journalists who don't understand the difference between mitigation, adaptation and loss and damage. Uh, they don't, for example, understand the kind of nuanced approach to climate change, what are some of the issues pertaining to it, whether it's, you know, carbon sequestration rates, whether it's carbon sinks, whether it's carbon trading. Um, there's not much sophistication from that perspective. So, you know, in, in Fiji's case, we've seen one or two of the media outlets who are completely seems to be, you know, opposed uh, to climate change matters, uh, so a couple of them in, in our recent experience only focused on well, how many people went to Glasgow and what was the cost of going to Glasgow. And that was it, that was the extent of the 
of their discourse on climate change. So I think there's a lot more that can be done and I think the media also needs to understand that whenever you talk about development or even development finance, it actually equates to climate finance. Uh, even when we had this pandemic, I mean, this pandemic has been a huge blow to our economy. Uh, borders got shut down, tourists stopped coming. When you have a sector that contributes about 40% towards your GDP, our revenues were gutted overnight. In last year, December, January, we had three cyclones. You know, one of the cyclones, we received the same amount of rainfall in 24 hours that London gets in a year. So, I mean, these are the types of, you know, things that's actually emerging and happening. And we don't necessarily see the level of uh, sophistication in reporting by media organizations uh, in the Pacific or more specifically in Fiji. So I think, you know, hopefully through international organizations there can be a lot more training. And I think uh, the other point, of course, is that <clears throat> climate change, at least in the Pacific, is not a, it should not be highlighted as a political partisan, uh, you know, issue. It really is a, uh, a regional issue. We have countries, for example, where they are actually losing the islands. It's, it's being submerged under water. So what it does, it has an impact on your EEZ because you measure your EEZ from your islands, you know, furthest part of the islands, and then you go out 200, uh, 200 kilometers uh, into the sea. So if your islands are now submerged under water, does that mean you lose the size of your EEZ? And recently, the Pacific Island leaders, you know, uh, issued a declaration, they're trying to work through unclosed United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea to say, look, we must maintain our EEZ territoriality and notwithstanding the fact that our islands are actually being submerged. So those are some really critical issues that requires a lot of analysis, a lot of understanding that indeed can be simplified and put forward to the public by the media and I think the media can do a lot more. Well, we are grateful to the Minister Ayas Sayed Hayoum for his time to give us this interview. And uh, equally, we are grateful to our members uh, from Fijian Broadcasting Corporation who secured and recorded the interview. <music>
uh, sometime in the mid-century. If everything that has been promised has been done, then that might put us on course for somewhere just under two degrees. But the credibility of those pledges <clears throat> is far from complete because they often rest on technologies that have either not been de developed or not been deployed at scales. So big question mark over that. Looking at the short-term commitments instead, the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, um, if everything was fully implemented, everything that, that was promised at Glasgow, we are about on course for about 2.4 degrees of climate change with something like a 5% chance of two degrees and something like a 1% chance of 1.5 degrees. So we're not where we really want to be and putting the urgency of bending the curve and starting to really decarbonize uh, in context, we've got eight years left in this decade. If we were going to be on course for 1.5 degree trajectory, we would need to reduce over and above our current NDC pledges by the equivalent of two years worth of global greenhouse gas emissions over that eight year period. So we would really have to stop the global economy for two years and that, that's clearly not going to happen. So there is an urgent need to change to get us at somewhere on course to where we want to be. And the kind of low hanging fruit uh, in the title of, the, uh, of this session, um, we need to decarbonize as rapidly as possible, particularly to get away from coal. But increasingly, we also need to think about how to transition further out of fossil fuels. So in, in Glasgow, there was the launch of something called Beyond Oil and Gas, BOGA, which is the first time that any governments have committed to actually getting out of fossil fuels in general. We need to halt deforestation because the emissions associated with deforestation uh, from the land use sector are very large. We need to reduce methane uh, and uh, methane, reducing methane fast is one of the only ways that we can really start cooling the earth to counteract the warming of the earth to get, to get us back in some sort of degree of balance. And part of the uh, reducing methane is also about changing the way we eat and the amount of global uh, consumption of, of meat from intensive systems. But as our last session made clear, all of these things require both finance and they require <coughs> political leadership because whilst <clears throat> our own Prime Minister Boris Johnson said in, 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 in Glasgow, he said his vision for the future is to allow technology to drive things so we can have guilt-free flying or guilt-free consumption, that's clearly not going to be possible if we are going to really get on track. So we need to consider some of the issues associated with lifestyle changes. And that is where the political difficulty comes, as well as, as you said in the, in, in the question, the incumbent power really pushes us uh, on a business as usual or a business as usual with a marginal changes trajectory, trajectory, and that will not get us where we need to be. So somehow we've got to shift the incumbent power and somehow we've got to recognize collectively that lifestyle changes are part and parcel of where we, where we need to get to. Thanks very much. Um, we've, I think we, we need more time with you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over one question that, that, uh, that's, that's slated next, just so we can try to get back on track a little bit with the, with the schedule for, to make sure we hear from everyone else. Um, going back to, to COP, a, a lot of money and time was invested in COP26, and there are really big expectations from it. Do you believe that the, the agreements reached at COP are really worth this investment and all the attention it received? And if the messages remain optimistic and continue to say that there still is time to act, um, is that politics or science talking? Um. Well, you, of course, COP26 is a negotiation amongst 192 countries where each one has a power of veto. So you're always going to be in a situation where uh, progress is slower than you would hope. But if you look back 10 years or so, Copenhagen, Warsaw, previous COPs and said, in 10 years time or 12 years time or, or whatever, coming out of Glasgow would be where we are, where we are. Many people would say we've made good progress. So let's not be too negative about it. It's not as fast as we need to, but progress is being made. The issue really uh, is not a science question. It's not a knowledge question. 
there's perhaps a, 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 an awareness question, but it's not about the science, it's about politics, it's about ideology, it's about political pragmatism. So ideologically, many governments around the world, most governments around the world are committed to the kind of neoliberal uh, uh, framing of things, which is that markets are the solution and markets are based on consumption. Consumption is based on ultimately using some degree of natural resources. So when you're saying change consumption patterns, you're automatically running into running against the uh, neoliberal ideology and saying, actually, it might be uh, at a cost of economic growth. And so part of the challenge is how do you make the growth agenda still potent by recognizing that we'll end up in a better place if we do go through the transition. And part of it is also the political toxicity. I mean, as France found a few years ago with the Mayo Jeanne, a protest. If you're putting taxes on things like fuel or putting taxes on things like um, meat consumption or whatever it might be, if people are not taken along with you, then you end up in a situation where you absolutely don't get re-elected. And of course, that whole political cycle is not made really for achieving long-term goals, especially when they're perceived to come at a cost. So, you know, two things there. Do they come at a cost? Are we good at explaining that actually we'll be better off? How do we take people along and make it politically safe for politicians to show leadership and break into some of the power incumbencies, uh, the, the incumbent power that we, we currently have, which is acting as a break because people are people, uh, institutions, businesses, some uh, nation states are worried that their economic growth will be threatened by the transition. Okay, thank you. So that's you've you've touched on the challenge of communication there, communicating to to the general public about political decisions, uh, about the communicating science around the the impact of those decisions. The, the media clearly is a conduit within within that communication chain. What is the best way for media to be part of the mechanism for change? Well, I think as the previous speaker said so cogently, climate change is not something that you can just say, is it progress at COP? Is it going to cost me in terms of changing my lifestyle? Climate change is broadly speaking, an economic threat, an existential threat, a livelihood threat, but it also comes with, if we do transition to a low carbon economy, if we do re reduce the threats that come from climate change, if we do have low pollution in the atmosphere, if we do get our agriculture and food right so that we live healthily um, and we aren't uh, uh, subject to some of the, the, the ill health that comes from poor diets, we will be in a better place. Again, uh, the, the issue is not whether people will be in a better place, the issue is the journey, how to, how to get there. And it's technically difficult. There are lots of choices. There are many trade-offs in it. And it requires some sophistication of debate in the public sphere so that the, the whole issue becomes politicized with a small p so that people care enough about it to make it politically votable on responses to climate change uh, to allow leadership to have the space to be able to really, really lead. So there's a really, really important role in the media to be sophisticated communicators not just of the threats, not just of the risks, but the benefits of getting the thing done properly, the advantages in the long term for our children, our grandchildren, for uh, future generations of getting it right. And it's not a threat to us. Not acting is a threat to our lifestyle, not changing our lifestyle to better lifestyles, changing our economies to better economies, because we'll end up in a better place. Tim Benton, thank you very much. Thank you both for this uh, very interesting uh, conversation and uh, what a long list of uh, <laughs> um, tasks for media and uh, what the packed agenda for moving to clean economy and New Deal. Um, thank you very much. Our last session is uh, focused on 
what is media doing and what it should do, which was uh, referred for by previous speakers. And I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Bridget Leoni to lead this session. Okay, thank you very much, Natalia. Okay, so I'm very pleased to introduce you to this uh, World Broadcasting Union Disaster Risk Reduction Initiative, which is probably a unique example of what media and broadcasting union can do together to protect population and influence policymakers to take action. But before that, I would like to show you a short clip of David Attenborough, who is not only an important BBC broadcaster and natural historian, but also one of the strongest advocates for more action against climate change. He opened the COP26 in Glasgow last month, and this is what he said. My world is melting. You think you have control, we actually have no control. I'm absolutely terrified to bring a child to this world. Is this how our story is due to end? A tale of the smartest species doomed by that all too human characteristic of failing to see the bigger picture in pursuit of short-term goals. Perhaps the fact that the people most affected by climate change are no longer some imagined future generation, but young people alive today. Perhaps that will give us the impetus we need to rewrite our story, to turn this tragedy into a triumph. Wherever we restore the wild, it will recapture carbon and help us bring back balance. As we say, media play an important and essential part in alerting, informing, and educate, educating population on global issues, and climate change is for sure one of the most challenging ones. The WBU and DOR Media Initiative brings together five broadcasting unions, and namely ABU, the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union, EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, CBU, the Caribbean Broadcasting Union, AUB, the African Union of Broadcasters, and HASBU, the Arab State Broadcasting Union, and four UN organizations, namely UNTR, WMO, ITU, and IOC UNESCO, who for the first time agreed to work together to support the daily work of broadcasters to better alert uh, inform and educate for the most vulnerable population on what they can do to prevent, reduce, and protect themselves against the negative impacts of climate change and disaster risk. The project is a unique initiative to change the way broadcasters are reporting on climate change and disaster prevention through training and production projects. The global project aims at training 300 broadcasters in the world over three years. The first phase of the project started in October 2019 and has now reached the second phase. We have now five main guests for this, uh, situ for this session. First, let me welcome Javad Motagi, Secretary General from the Asia Pacific Broadcasting Union, who is one of the pioneers of the project. Mr. Javad, nice to be with you today. Um, you were one of the pioneers of the project after a World Broadcasting Union meeting in Tokyo in 2019. Can you tell us more about the project itself and what has been achieved so far? Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Yes, the movement um, started to strengthen in Tokyo when we were together uh, in November 2019 at the General Assembly of the ABU. We had the opportunity to have all Secretary Generals and Director Generals from several unions, as you mentioned, and also Miss Mummy. <clears throat> and uh, we met and we discussed and we came come, we come to conclusion that we have to work together. We have to work together with all unions under the umbrella World Broadcasting Union to ensure that broadcasters across the globe will be able to join this project. And through them, um, we can reach billions of audience uh, in different regions. And 
Good thing is that you and BRR understood the value of media. And as Mommy said at the beginning of this session, uh, she believes and all us uh, believe that uh, media has the main role, not only to create the awareness among the public, but also we have to look at training for the, um, for the media professionals. Yes, we have to look at the educating and informing uh, public and increasing the awareness. At the same time, we have to make sure that media professionals are trained, well trained in order to be tell, able to tell the story about climate change and its reactions. And the other point is that we have to make sure that radio, television, digital media would have uh, climate change units within their structure so that they can pay more attention in addressing this issue. And they have also, um, I would say, a data of human resources within their unions so that they can see who is able to teach and who is able to train others and also look at the next generation and how uh, we can serve them and uh, look into the actions. And finally, uh, look into the policy uh, issues in different countries. We have to make sure that media will uh, hold policymakers accountable when it comes to climate change and disaster risk reductions. And good thing about uh, Tokyo General Assembly was that we all were able to get together and we work as a team together with other members of this team to achieve this goal. Thank you, Mr. Jeff. We come back to you soon. But as I said before, the project includes as well four UN organizations. And one of the main founder and leading organization of the project was the, or he's the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. I'm pleased to invite our second speaker, Mrs. Janet Ellsworth, who is the UNDR Chief Communication, uh, um, Chief of Communication Advocacy and Knowledge Management. Uh, Janet, could, could you tell us why the UN, and in particular, why UNDR did develop the project? Yes, and good afternoon to all of the panelists and, and uh, attendees joining us today. Thank you. Um, so exactly as um, David just said there, and I think you heard from our SRSG earlier in the session, um, this really goes to the heart of what UNDRR is trying to do. In the Sunday Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which was adopted in 2015, we saw a shift in the role of media from the traditional way that we might see the media in terms of reporting and in terms of information flow, which is a very important role, but a shift to also include the media as a stakeholder in DRR. And when we have this multi-stakeholder approach, which is outlined in that document, um, that's when we have an all of society, a multi-stakeholder approach. That's when we really start to make lasting change. And for UNDRR, it was the recognition that we not only had to make sure that the media had the right tools, the right knowledge to report on disaster risk reduction in the right way, but we also need to build sustainability into our systems so that the people with that knowledge don't move on, or like myself, I move from being a journalist into the UN system. So so the, the knowledge and, um, and the skills that I had came with me. So in working with the broadcasting union, what we're trying to do is to build that knowledge and, and sustainability into the system so that it stays within the unions and the training um, and knowledge is, is kept within the institutions and passed down um, through the generations of broadcasters who come, who come after the ones there now. If we think about climate change and the environment, if we think around even 30 or 20 years ago, it wasn't normal to have environment correspondence at that moment. But now it's very normal to have environmental correspondence or even climate change specialists within um, broadcasters. And that doesn't happen by accident. That happens over time with the realization that that's an issue that's not going away. So now that we have those specialists, what we also need to equip them with is the knowledge of the intersection between climate change and disaster risk reduction. And that way we can give them the tools to report not only the moment when a disaster strikes, which is obviously very important, but the time in between the disasters when there is no, no disaster. That's the moment when we need to be advocating DRR practices for, for resilience. Um, and we really saw that shift at COP26 um, that we 
moving away from the, the time when we when we focus on re response, but we focus now as a proactive um, action to take before the next disaster strikes. That shift was quite clear at COP26, and we'll have the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction coming up in May 2022 in Bali, actually, in the, the area, the region of the world covered by the ABU. And so it's a really exciting opportunity for the media of that region to get involved um, as we move towards COP27. Yeah, thank you. The Caribbean Broadcasting Union was the, actually the first union to pilot the project in the Caribbean island and to implement a series of training sessions uh, back in November 2020. Sonia Gill, who is the Secretary General of the Caribbean Broadcasting Union, cannot be with us today due to, time, due to the time difference, but she has accepted to send us the following message. The UNDR project with the World Broadcasting Unions has quite rightly targeted the Pacific and Caribbean SIDS represented by ABU and CBU respectively for the first phase of this pioneering project, Media Saving Lives. Here in the Caribbean, the response to the offer of training was phenomenal. In fact, more than 140 participants from around the region proudly received certificates during a virtual presentation ceremony just a few weeks ago. The training was and remains crucial to supporting these media professionals when the next disaster strikes. It will help these committed personnel continue their work of informing, educating, and entertaining. Even while they pick up the pieces of, of their own lives after disasters, they go back to the job of supporting national relief and recovery efforts, bolstered by the knowledge and techniques gained. Our public service media in these vulnerable developing states fully understand that they offer a lifeline to communities in the aftermath of natural disasters. Broadcasters help in the search for missing persons, update those left without shelter on the organization of relief efforts, and offer the public a space to share and collectively heal. As we look forward to similar training activities that continue to build the capacity of our media professionals, we hope for an expansion of the focus, not just to the individual personnel, but to the media institutions. CBU has already begun a discussion with the Caribbean Disaster and Emergency Management Agency, SEDEMA, a committed partner over the years, about building the capacity of public and private media houses to ensure business continuity in the immediate aftermath of major events. If the institutions are not also well equipped to ensure that they can quickly return to operation, and if they are not the direct beneficiaries of sectoral relief and support, then the entire national recovery effort will be severely hampered. I look forward to ABU and other sister unions through excellent advocacy efforts such as this media summit, joining us in this call for wider and deeper attention to the media organizations playing their vital role in mitigating the effects of hazards and helping with recovery afterwards. I wish for you a continued productive discussion and I thank you for your attention. Africa is very vulnerable to disasters and already very impacted by climate change, as we have seen earlier in Madagascar. And the African Union of Broadcasters was also among the first union to join the campaign. I have the pleasure to have with us today Gregory Jacka, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the African Union of Broadcasting. Mr. Jacka, can you tell us why and how AUB is involved in the project so far and how African media are playing an important part to raise awareness on climate change issues. Thank you, Madam Brigitte Leonine. I would like, first of all, um, 
to thank once more uh, Mrs. Mami, who gave us a listening ear to broadcasting unions during uh, the ABU General Assembly in Japan in 2019 for the implementation of this project. It is also the opportunity for me to thank my brother, Dr. Javad, who always involves all unions in key projects. Uh, let me tell you that in Africa, we believe uh, Dr. Javad is our light barriers in this initiative. We all agree the media has the duty to be at the front, uh, at the fourth, at the forefront of DRI and climate and climate changes. Today, the AUB takes pride in joining its effort in one of the most pressing concern of the African continent. A lot is to be done in as much as DRR and climate change reporting is concerned. So we believe that our contribution in this timely project is key. Uh, concerning how we cover the, these events, I would like to talk, this question is, um, is very important. It has as earlier indicated, a lot is to be done in our broadcasting organization in Africa. I take, for instance, when you visit a TV station in Africa, you will easily find five or more sport desk journalists. But when it comes to envir environmental issues or science issues, you have only one correspondence and at time you don't have even one. This is an alarming and that is why we at the AUB do not hesitate in making them, uh, in making them participate in projects like this, uh, like this one, so that they see the importance of mitigating climate change issues and DRR. So this is a continuous pro uh, process which requires requires permanent sens sensitization, assisting members by involving them in trainings, award-winning award programs, production funds, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jaka. And stay with us because we, you will become, I mean, you will come to the next uh, discussion that we're going to, to have in a moment. I just wanted to mention that the Arab State Broadcasting Union, ASBU, was not able to join us today in this panel discussion, but they're because they are having actually their general assembly as we speak, but they will play an active uh, part in the second phase of the project that will start very soon. So now I would like to uh, go back to Mr. Javad and Mr. Jaka and continue to, the conversation with some reflections. Um, for the first time with the COVID situation, we have seen that prevention and science can make the front page headlines and become even priority issues for all citizens in a couple of weeks, to the extent that it was sometimes the only news that we could watch on TV. The COVID situation has proved as well that prevention is a good sell in terms of news and, and something that, uh, that is also valued by audiences. So, what is missing in the current climate change conversation to make climate change urgent and relevant to media houses and policymakers? I would like to address the question maybe first to Mr. Javad and then to Mr. Jaka. So over well, to you, Mr. Javad. Yeah, possibly I can add to what my brother Gregor said uh, is that the importance of this project is that all unions are involved. And uh, this is important because if you look at ABU, we are and we are able to reach 3.5 billion audiences. Look at the capacity of AUB, look at the capacity of ASVU. I just had a talk to Abdurrahim Suleiman, ASVU Director General. He is fully committed, ASVU is fully committed mm -hmm. and will help. Or you have heard what um, uh, Sonia said, or EBU. And uh, so this is important because by working with unions, you would be able to reach uh, public, I mean, the huge public uh, populations and media professionals to address the issues. The second point is that 
uh, we uh, mentioned, one of the speakers mentioned that uh, we, uh, I think it was Sonia, that we look at the local institutions, we look at the translation of these training aspects into or multiplying it with a local institution who can train in local language, the broadcasters, enabling them to address the issues. And uh, then uh, that would be able to address all um, uh, issues related to uh, uh, this um, uh, movement, including fake news, including other things that we all mm. have to talk and media should address. But one of the main points that we have to touch is the trust that we can create for public broadcasters. This is important because trust uh, is the main and most important asset a public service broadcaster or a commercial broadcaster may have. And that is something that we have seen in pandemic and we have to keep it uh, and we have to continue to be a reference point uh, a resource point for the public to check when it comes to fake news and when it comes to fact finding when it comes to issues that really affect media and there again uh, we have to work with WBU as a uh, uh, Gregor, I mentioned. Thank you. Okay. But please, Javed, I mean, could, could you come back to the question that we were just um, addressing, you know, the fact that the current climate change conversation, I mean, is not completely fully addressed in the um, in the media organization. And, and we've seen that COVID uh, actually shown that prevention can be a good sell in terms of news. So how do you compare what has happened with COVID and, and climate change? I mean, the, the climate change, the way the climate change is actually uh, dealt and, and broadcast, you know, within media organizations. You see, climate, uh, COVID um, taught us many lessons. And uh, uh, yes, it created difficulties for all the world. It created difficulties for broadcasters in reaching the public, including the way that we are addressing. Instead of getting together face-to-face -to -face networking opportunities, we have no other choice but uh, talking online. But uh, that was a lesson for us that uh, our mandate as broadcasters will not be changed, uh, no matter where we will, how we can reach the audience. And this is the way that we learned from COVID that we have to continue servicing our public. We have to continue increasing the awareness of public through whatever need. That's one. The second point is that uh, digital media playing a very important role in our job. And uh, this is, again, uh, something that we learn much more compared to previous uh, pandemic, that we have to pay attention to that. And the third point is that... Uh, we have to train ourselves, media professionals, uh, to enable ourselves and media professionals to address the matter online and also uh, deal with content distribution across the globe. Yeah, so thank you. So I'm, I'm addressing the same question to Mr. Jacka. I mean, do you think that media are doing their part in Africa to cover the issue of climate change? Yes, thank you. Uh, from the beginning of my statement, I told you that a lot has to be done in Africa in this particular field. I can even say that uh, with this project is the beginning because we did not have journalists who were capable to talk about it. Now, as Mr. Uh, Javad said, we are using our local languages. And this is very, very important in Africa to bring the message to the people in the villages and so on. We want to emphasize on that particular aspect. People in our villages don't speak, most of them don't speak French nor English and so on. We have local languages. And we want, we want people to uh, go uh, to have the message in the language with the example of uh, taking in the environment so that they can appropriate themselves this message. And you, you brought up a, a, a very interesting question. When you make, uh, you compare COVID and, uh, and, um, and uh, climate change, I would like to say that we have to bring this message at the level of COVID to show to people that we, when this climate change is not taken into consideration, it can bring death. It can uh, uh, destroy all the environment. 
And if you look very well what is happening with the COVID messages this time, you see that at the beginning, we are talking about curing COVID, how to cure COVID. But now the message is focused on prevention. That's why I think that we also should bring our messages as message at the level of prevention. Tell to people that if nothing is done today, tomorrow we will be in danger. That's what I think that is the importance of, of, of the message we have to do. And it's very interesting because we, have, we are a network so that when the message is brought to in Asia, people on the TV in Africa can see that ah, this thing is a worldwide problem. So that's why uh, in Africa, we take this project as a very, very important project. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Mr. Javad, back to you. I'd just like to know a little bit, I mean, if you could explain how you're going to make uh, climate change and DR a, priori a priority, I mean, in your programming and how are you going to work with all the unions to make sure that really climate change and DOR are a top priority in your programming, your education program and, and your current affairs and news programs. How are you going to do that? We are working closely with CEOs, director generals, presidents, and uh, uh, the other aspects out of this COVID is that we are much more closer to them and constantly meeting them online and bringing this attention, this important issue to their attention, because if the CEO, DG of a media organization, radio organization, television, if they are aware of the responsibility that they have, the impact would be much more. And we, are, we, we don't say media has done uh, enough. I believe that media can do much more. This is what uh, we all believe. And uh, we also say that media should go to other things like investigative journalism in reporting about the climate change and all that and touch issues in so-called dark houses. What happens in dark houses in terms of policies and uh, uh, decisions that are made which goes against uh, the people's wish. So our point is that we persuade media uh, leaders to pay attention and to take a lead and make sure that the message will be well produced, well developed and well disseminated and give particular, special attention to that. You see, that's why I said that we need climate change unit, unit in all uh, member organizations. Why? Because you have a sports unit and they cover big major sport events all over the world, Olympics, World Cup, etc. But in many organizations, we do not have climate change unit who address the issue because we don't have required resources to produce relevant program to add this. Is. That's why we are pushing that. And we believe that ABU and other unions are doing very good in that respect, but we need more partnership from UNDRR. And this uh, concerted effort, as uh, Mami has created, you, Bridget, played a very important role, Janet and Natalia, my colleague, did a very uh, good job in putting all things together. And I believe this movement has to be continued it, this is uh, the way forward, and that uh, also will uh, actually result in awareness building among public. And we also should assess our achievement, possibly every uh, now and then, every year, we have to assess what we have achieved, introduce success indicators for media, and so on and so on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe uh, a last word, Mr. Jaka. Do you want to, to say something before we close the session? Yes, thank you, Bridget. Uh, it was a very interesting project. Uh, in Africa, in AUB, we think that we have to improve in the quality of our messages. We have to improve. And these messages should take example from the, the environment of people where they are living. And as uh, Dr. Javad said, that's why we have started ourselves by creating a small unit on DRR in our, in our union. This unit is held by Madam Komol Margaret. And this is to help our members to create 
within the, the, the organization, small unit, which will be a sort of, uh, there will be a, a focal point on, uh, for this uh, very interesting program. So we start by the union at the headquarters. We have a small unit and we think that this second phase will give us an opportunity to start going uh, uh, in our members organization so that we can have uh, a, a sort of focal point. But for now, what we have, we are, the first thing we, on which we are working is to have a network of African journalists dedicated to DRI. That's what we are trying to do. Margaret is working hardly on that with Mr. Emmanuel Wonkibe. We think that uh, before the beginning of the second phase, we'll have a network of journalists dedicated to this uh, particular project. And we would like to thank Dr. Javad once more. He, you know, Dr. Javad is an African. He has African <laughs> And okay, Natalia so. also, Leonie. <laughs> Natalia, Leonie, and so on. We would like to <laughs> thank you for all African. what you are doing. I agree, <laughs> I agree, Gregor, but we are, we are citizens of the world. We all are <laughs> citizens of the world. That, you know? That's a citizen of the world mean citizen of Africa also. <laughs> All of you, Bridget, Leonie, <laughs> Natalia, and okay. so thank you thank, very much. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you uh, to all my speakers uh, who joined us today uh, and thank you for this very interesting conversation. So over to you, Natalia. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to um, thank Janet. We know she's very busy. She's having with her uh, team retreat, but uh, uh, what do you think? Do we have future together? <laughs> with this project. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I was just listening to the, um, to the speakers there really quickly to reflect on the challenges. And one of the biggest challenges about getting um, DRR stories onto the media is the response, the human response to risk, the way that we judge risk and our exposure to it. It's very, it's very personal and it's also very um, influenced by all the things that influence us as individuals. So it's a very hard challenge, um, as we've seen with the infodemic and the way people share things that only choose, they, they are in, a, in tune with what they believe. And I think this is the moment where the, the media has an extremely important part to play. It's, a, it's around trust. It's about access to, um, to science and data, but it's also about how you present that to to your audiences, and this is um, this is why we, we all know as journalists how hard it is to um, to get your editor um, to get your story on, even when you know it's really important. If they think that the public is not going to be interested in it, so when you when we build the institutional capacity throughout the media, throughout the unions, throughout the broadcasters, that's when we really have a body of people who understand how important. Um, that, uh, that those stories are and, and the role that they can play. So for us, this is um, a flagship project for us. It's, a, a, it's hugely important, not only to the organization, but also to the individuals who are engaged with it. I'd like to send my um, thanks and UNDRS, thanks to, um, to the ABU, to all the other broadcasters, um, to WBU and uh, also the Africa Broadcasting Union and all of the partners who are engaged in that. Um, and to yourselves as individuals for getting this off the ground. So it's very important to us. We see it um, only growing from strength to strength um, and we're delighted to be um, one of the organizations such an important project, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Bridget. With uh, this, um, the sessions in uh, run out, but before uh, we are not uh, saying goodbye yet because um, I'm inviting now Arasso to, do a recap of uh, the main points, what people expect from media and what media should do. Russell? Yeah, th th thanks, Natalia. Uh, yeah, as I try to sum up um, some of the main points made during this all too brief conference, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's incumbent upon me to concentrate on the advice and suggestions made uh, regarding the role that we in the media and particularly within the ABU family that we can do to help to save our communities and regions from, of course, the climatic challenges that we'll 
increase during the years ahead. So I'll briefly go through, I think, some of the main points made by, made by our speakers, beginning, of course, with Mami Mitsutori. Um, she mentioned the platforms that are available and referred to this project that we come back to all the time through UNDRR, through ABU, uh, the platform shares information and broadcast techniques. Um, and she was advocating that broadcasters, uh, we should use them, all the outlets that we have, to prevent misinformation and help people understand the how and the why. Um, the, the, the discussion that, that I had with Yuri uh, uh, Rogeli, um, he underlined the need for us to reflect not just the political arguments involved in, in climate change, but more importantly, the developments from all sectors and for us to be responsible as media outlets in managing expectations. Those are some of the lessons that we learned from COP. Ben Strauss then from Climate Central in the USA demonstrated a visual tool for us to use um, as we explain and assess the impacts of sea level rises. The incredible stories we can tell by using visual and digital technologies. Ben Churchill then, one of his opening quotes, focus on the facts, not chase the headlines. And he was saying as well how important storytelling is. And the storytelling must come from trusted resources. And so that's what we do as broadcasters. We build that trust up over time with our audiences because we give them the facts, hopefully. And we remain uh, as, as, as organizations bringing people to account and making sure that people get the, the, the true stories happening. Dr. Rahire Nadia, uh, the, the Minister of Environment of Madagascar, reminded us that we are part of a participatory process. And she mentioned that uh, the, the population in Madagascar, 80% of them are, are illiterate. And therefore we have a massive role and obligation as media to inform and to communicate, particularly about what's happening with the climate and issues that perhaps people don't normally understand in their day-to-day -day lives. From Fiji, uh, the Minister responsible for climate uh, issues, Aya Sayed Khayoum, um, reminded us to uh, achieve adaptation goals. Again, one of the points from COP. Uh, and to do that, necessary funding is needed. That is a must. And the need therefore for more specialist journalism is a priority. Understanding climate finance is essential, for example, to explain to others. And therefore, the line that he was using was this broadcast sophistication. And broadcast sophistication is a target on climate issues. And the same again, we heard from Tim Benton from Chatham House. He reminded us that progress is always slower than you'd like. Again, he was referring to COP. But if you can take people along with you, progress is possible. The tool for this taking people along, of course, is communication. And he again reminded us that sophistication of debate is required, and that can only come from the media. And this final session, uh, obviously, it, con it concentrated on uh, the UNDRR WBU uh, project. Um, and, 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 and Javad Motangi actually answered many of the questions and comments from the chat box that we've had during this, uh, during, during this conference. Um, in reference to the UNDRR and WBU project, he addressed many of the points that are being raised. And the ABU are, of course, actively promoting this project with broadcasters across the region. And Jeanette, Jeanette Ellsworth well from UNDRR talked about this shift of role for the media as a stakeholder. Yes, it's normal now in many outlets to have environment correspondence. In others, it's not. But what we have to do is to give them the tools. We have to give them the, the knowledge. We have to give them the techniques. And that's what I think this project is, is actually working on. And that was proved by Sonia Gill from CBU. She spoke about the phenomenal response to this training project. Um, and she is looking forward to an expansion in capacity building. Gregoire and Jaka, of course, from, from AUB, said, of course, that media is at the heart of DRR reporting. And this project is just the beginning to find ways to bring the messages to the villages. We have to communicate, he said, at the community level and that in a language that people can understand. And therefore the network of DRR journalists that's being built is absolutely necessary. And if I can just finish with, again, a line that, uh, that Dr. Javad used, that media hasn't done enough. We must take it now to the leaders to take note. And that then can move down the various organizations. So 
I hope that, uh, that you agree with me that we've managed to collate a great number of insightful comments during this digital conference, but as we're always reminded, um, let's move these words into action. Media outlets, let's be more proactive. Natalia. Thank you, Russo. And uh, it's obvious media has to be a leader in communication with the public. And it's obvious media has to be prepared for this. Um, we are at the end of the sixth ABU Media Summit on uh, Climate Action and Disaster Prevention. Uh, but that's not the end of conversation. This summit is actually kickstarting series of monthly in-depth um, webinars where we start learning in depth to, re to achieve this sophistication that we have to have in order to be able to cover the complex issues of new climate uh, 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 deal or anything that comes and to have action to advocate action in politicians, in people. Um, before we go, I would like to thank everyone that joined us today, our panelists, our moderators, um, our colleagues that uh, take time to join the summit. And uh, above all, I would like to thank the ABU team that brought to you this uh, summit. Uh, on a very short notice, we had only three weeks to prepare it after COP26, but I think we did a good job. Um, I, I also want to thank United Nations uh, Development Program for allowing us to um, use these marvelous messages from the dinosaur, and they have allowed us to use another part of their great um, Don't Choose Extinction campaign. Uh, we say goodbye with the song of hugely popular Turkish singer Sertap Erener, who's gonna end. Goodbye. <coughs> Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. Going extinct is a bad thing. And driving yourselves extinct in 70 million years, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you. Just you, it's not just